Welcome to the Dividend Talk podcast, episode number eight, Dividend Growth Investment Mistakes. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DGI. Today we will talk about some of our mistakes as dividend growth investors, what we learned and what you should look to avoid. As always, we're delighted that you could join us today. And if you're new, please hit that like button and subscribe to us. Feel free to check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify and all your other favorite platforms. See you on the inside. Oh man, another another episode of Dividend Talk. It feels like it's been a long time. I was I've been on vacation. I know you've been on vacation, but how you been? Oh, uh, it was just wonderful. I wasn't doing a lot. People might have seen me active a little bit on Twitter, but it was rather related to the stock market. But other than that, I was just having a lot of family time, exploring the country a little bit. One of the benefits of uh, having COVID nineteen around here. And. Um, yeah, it was just really relaxing and you know it's cucumber time anyway everywhere in the world so uh, except maybe uh, uh when it comes to trump but other than that uh, it was just relaxing nothing on my head hardly any tech around me how was it for you yeah same i mean this this was a kind of forced vacation as in a factory shutdown never really happens but it's a it's a benefit i suppose of covid19 for us i got a week off I didn't take my laptop anywhere. I was very minimal on Twitter on, on my phone. Didn't look at the news, didn't look at anything, just kind of spent some time hiking, swimming, that that kind of thing. So no, it was a really, really great week. The only the only negative was the weather rained Monday to Friday. It's nice today, it's nice tomorrow, and of course I'm back into work, so it's gonna be nice all next week. <laughs> but that's, that's the joys of Ireland. But no, it was really, really relaxing. I feel like today is going to be a nice short podcast. I don't have much to say on news or, or any of that kind of things. I haven't haven't really kept up to date with it. So unless unless you have anything from the news, we might just jump into our, our main topic, I suppose. Yeah, let's do that because I think um, uh, Trump, Microsoft and TikTok is not something really for our podcast today. <laughs> so why don't we just start with the main topic? And I like this topic actually because um, it's... One of those topics that we could often bring up, I think, but I think this is the ideal time. It's like mid-year, reflect a little bit, what were our learnings, what were the mistakes we made. So mm. so I'm curious, uh, uh, Engineer My Freedom, what's your biggest uh, mistake that you have so far made as an investor, DGI oh, investor? Oh, I've made a couple of other. I suppose the biggest one I've made this year um, was buying uh, Tangar at the start of the year. I think I've, met, I've mentioned this before. Um, but I, I bought them, they were $15, something like that. And I remember, like, it, it really, really what it was was chasing yield, chasing that high dividend yield. And, and I can make any other excuse, but I suppose <laughs> as, as, a, as a relatively newbie investor or dividend growth investor, I think it's something that everybody falls into eventually. You start with good intentions, but you see this high yield of 7%, and it's like, Oh, how much cash flow can I get from that? I get fifty dollars. Get this, and I kind of got sucked in. And I, I remember when I was researching them, I wasn't researching them objectively. I was researching them with the knowledge I was probably going to buy them. So I was trying to fit. I was trying to fit something that matched. I wanted them to match my criteria. If that makes sense, I wasn't looking at them and going, oh, "Why shouldn't I buy these?" It was more why should I buy these? So I was trying to make a match my investment thesis. And I suppose that's one of the, like you'll see my last post on Walgreens and I have, came from you actually, but I had this scoring system, uh, tweaked it a small bit to suit me, but it makes me look objectively and if they're within a range, they will buy to a whole. It's, it's, it's a more clear cut decision. I'm, I'm not, I'm letting the data make a decision for me rather than going out there looking for them to fit my, my, my thesis but I, I bought them i bought them at 15 and then the mistakes just got worse they, they went down to six dollars i think 
and I sold them at six dollars thinking that they drop but no they actually went down to 450 and they went back up to six and I thought they might drop down again so what I did is I sold them thinking that they dropped and I was going to rebuy them lower. <laughs> what actually happened is I sold them at six they went straight up to eleven dollars and now they're back hovering around six dollars so I'm just done with them I'm like <laughs> that's <laughs> enough that's enough of tango for me I just need to forget about them for a while and one thing REITs is not my strong point it's it's, it's not something that I'm particularly comfortable in at the moment. So I probably should have just stayed away until until I knew. So that's that's something I've learned from it. And it's one it's it's what has actually inspired me to write these posts. You'll see I've done three or four of them now. I'm all I'm doing is going through my portfolio now and picking out each company and writing a you know, actually doing proper research on them. And if they don't sit with my thesis, I'm gonna sell them. I'm just gonna get rid yeah. of them. Because another one of my mistakes, it's not really a mistake, but another one that I did was I just followed blindly the dividend growth investor. I, I've had his newsletter. Um, and as you said, he, his goal is to make a thousand a month and he sends out 10 companies and, and so on. And when I look through my portfolio, I'm, I'm looking at companies like Karen and Health. I don't know anything about them, what they do, but I have one share of them. Why did I buy them? So I know it's only one share, <laughs> but. They shouldn't be there. I, I don't know anything about the company. I have two shares in CVS. I have two shares in AMP. I, I mean, they were bought basically because he wrote a newsletter, and that's not how you. That's not how you invest. It was good to start, but I, I'm in this now three years, so I want to be making my own decisions. So that's where my blog posts are coming in. I'm going to go through each each one of my 39 companies, go through them in, in detail. I just make my own decisions, just get rid of what I don't need. So they're pretty much two of my biggest mistakes. Just just following blindly without known companies, because that's just not not a good idea. And then trying to find companies with high yield and making them match my thesis rather than the other way around. So So it's confirmation bias. Yeah, pretty pretty much confirmation bias. And and I suppose having it in your head that I'm going to buy them anyway is not a good way to to be an I think I think it should be the opposite as an investor. You should be trying to find reasons not to invest invest your money. You want to preserve your capital. You want you like you want to make sure that your money is as safe as it can be, I suppose. Um and confirmation bias is not not the way to, to do that. So look they are they are they are two of my mistakes. And I think for most new investors they're probably going to do the same. And that's pretty much evident on Twitter, I think. Um, and not to bash yeah. any guy on Twitter, and, and I think it's great people are getting started, but but there's certain guys in big accounts and they tweet a company like AT&T, for example, and my news feed is full of people, buy T under 29, buy T under 30. And, and my question is, why are you buying them under 30? What is yeah. the reason? Like, if you have a reason, great, go for it. But if you're doing it because somebody else said, buy them at under 29, it's not going to be good long term because one, you don't know why you bought them. You don't know when to get out. You don't know, like, you don't know what's wrong with the company, what's right with the company. So, it's it's um, it's something that I see a lot on Twitter, and it's something that I've done myself, so I know where these people are coming from. But I think as an investor, you should kind of grow and learn and make your own decisions, and then have healthy conversations with people. And sometimes you're wrong, sometimes you're right. But once you make a decision and you know that you've researched it and you're comfortable with it, then you can sleep a little. I can sleep a little better knowing that it's it's my decision. Yeah. Um, and that's I suppose that's one one thing that I see on Twitter. But look, those are, those are my mistakes. Would it be fair to say that um, if you don't have the time to put the effort in it mm. uh, to do your own research, that you will be better off with just a high yield ETF? I think so. Yeah. Look, look. If you don't have the time, th there's there's lots of people out there. Like I said, dividend growth investors one, and uh, the standard income report is another. And they're really good. In fairness, they are really good. And these guys know their stuff. But it's all well and good. Other people knowing their stuff. You're trusting your money in other people's decisions. And right or wrong, you have to like it's your money to lose, not theirs. So yeah. if you don't have the time. I think an ETF is the way to go. And probably for most most people, ETFs are, are a good idea. I mean, there's there's little maintenance on them, they're, they're cheap. 
Um, we know there's some issues in tax and some issues for European investors with, with vanguards and, and the likes, but if you don't have time, ETFs are definitely a better option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think those learnings resonate a lot with me as well. Uh, yeah. I had to also go through that process at a certain moment and I'm still having some junk in my uh, portfolio somewhere in the corner that uh, I need to clean up, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody has some 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 junk in there. I mean, look for the, for the most part, they're all good companies, but I don't know why I have at least ten of these companies. I don't I don't know why I have them there, only because they're on a, on a newsletter. And what was funny is that he's at the start he sent out ten companies each each month, and he was doing it on is it Robin Hood or he was he was getting free free trade, so it didn't cost him anything to do ten. Yeah. But when I I was doing it. They weren't free. So I was doing 10 companies and I'm paying fees on each of the 10 companies. And it took me about five or six months to go, you know, I, I, I'm paying more money than I should be. Why not just pick one company? And, and yeah. So I suppose that's where I started. It was, it was, it was good for me as a learning curve to get in and he writes good reports. But if you don't know why you have a company in your portfolio, they, they probably shouldn't be there. And, as a, as a newbie investor, I think it's easy to follow somebody, but you have to make your own decisions. Yeah. Hmm. How about you? I've got uh, I've I've got definitely some mistakes, and probably I'm still making mistakes. But <laughs> one that I would like to highlight is probably a little bit typical for how I look at um, what my investment philosophy is. So my investment philosophy is actually not only pure dividend growth investing but also value investing it's kind of a combination for both because i take the valuation really into consideration and then sometimes you in your research you find companies that you know in my case and then you think like wow hey what am i not understanding what everyone else uh, uh, doesn't see about this company and one of those companies is tupperware so back in, uh, I think it was 2016, I bought Tupperware around somewhere between 60 and $70. And I did extensive research. I, I, everything looked okay to me. And they had just, you know, a little bit what IBM has now, a slightly declining revenue, um, all the time blaming currency, headwinds and such. And I thought, like, okay, you know, the dollar is just getting stronger, you know, that will stop one time and then uh, the wind will be, uh, it will become a tailwind. And um, so I bought it, then it dropped to, I don't know, to 55 or 50. I added some more and um, then the, the dividend yield started to increase when it was around 40, I think. It, it, it got to 8% or something like that. And then suddenly they cut the dividend. And what I wanted to also let you know is that before that, and I will never forget the name of the CEO. It was Rick Goings. And he was on YouTube, always uh, on, on Jim Cramer and such. And he was really, really well-spoken about the company and how they were doing business uh, um, in, in Asia Pacific, empowering women, how Indonesia is one of the biggest markets. So I thought, like, hey, okay, yeah, I understand. And in America, maybe it's a bit passe, yeah, uh, Tupperware, but, uh, you know, in developing countries, this this could be a really good solution there and then uh, creating uh, businesses for, for, for women at home and, and, and such. So I was really bought into that as a catalyst. But no, it was just every quarter that it, it got worse and worse and worse. And I kept in there still thinking about this, you know, this 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 theory that I had this thesis in my head. And then when the dividend cut came, I, I thought, like, okay, you know, this thesis, thesis just didn't play out. So I sold it. I, so I cut my losses at 40% or something like that. But I just checked the stock price. It actually went in March almost to two and a half dollars. It, it bounced back to $15. So it just shows that this company uh, totally um, doesn't have it. And uh, yeah, it was just... It was not so much that I was following others. I discovered it myself uh, by, by, via my screeners. It was just a total misjudgment um, thinking about the brand as how I knew it from when I was a child. Uh, mm. Everyone had the Tupperware in the fridge. Yeah. 
yeah, and and still thinking about it. I checked their innovation. I thought like, oh, cool stuff. You know, really useful. There must be lots of women in uh, in, in Indonesia that want to cut apples like that or something like. <laughs> Probably don't even have apple trees. So I'm not so knowledgeable about Indonesia. But uh, you know, just a total misjudgment, and and this is typically the mistake for me. It's not so much anymore following others, but just totally misjudging based on my thesis, and don't and then not cutting my losses quick enough because once I go for it, I I, I go for it right, and 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 I'm fully convinced, and it becomes like a a portfolio with a cap in my my allocation strategy. So let's say it's a four thousand euro. I will, I will try to dollar cost average in into that. Whether it's a, let's say a tier four company, or none of the companies straight away becomes a tier one, and and but I started doing that to build in this fill fill safe mechanisms that I don't straight away start putting I don't know ten thousand euro uh, over the next five years into a stock, mm. if my thesis would be wrong. So um, and this is the fill safe because my misjudgments are the biggest ones. And that has to do with the fact that I use value investing as an approach as well. And then sometimes you might be just catching what they say, a falling knife or something like that. But is that, and you mentioned it earlier, is that more confirmation bias on the brand? Because you're familiar with a brand and it's it's in your head. Yeah. You've already, you already have an idea of the company. You already like them. So you're just confirming and, and does that have more of a role? Well, but I run it through the numbers at that times, and uh, by all metrics, for me, it was undervalued at the time. Mm. The 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 thing that I misjudged on was that it was just a deteriorating business, yeah, a declining business. While I thought they are, and and that's also what the CEO was saying all the time that they are in the midst of a turnaround. They are investing mm. so much in innovation and in these markets, and look, there's a little uptick there. This yeah. is a signal. So. I bought also into the story of the CEO, um, and and this uh, for me it's really important to get to know the CEOs. I haven't really figured out yet how to um, how to I said um, filter out the the smooth talkers yeah. because Jeff Immelt was exactly the same person for me, like such a Rick going. The only thing that I see is that it's a similar kind of generation, probably like an Ivy League. Uh, a uh, guy, gray hair in their 60s, 70s. That's usually with those I've made the mistakes. Because yeah. if you look at the Sachin Nadella and the new generation CEOs, I think there's much more transparency and honesty in, in their behavior. Of course, not with all of them, but at least with the big companies, I I, I get that feeling more. Yeah, well, maybe they don't have skin in the game as long as, as the others. And they, they, I suppose over time, they've acquired the skills to talk themselves out of situations or into better situations maybe a skill yeah. maybe maybe the newer new ceos are a bit more green and over time they may acquire those skills yeah. but i mean as mistakes go I, I feel that a misjudgment it is a mistake but it's 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 part of the process isn't it you, no yeah. i don't i don't think there's anybody even warren buffett i don't think anybody will be able to judge every single company perfect all the time yeah but I suppose though is when when do you get out of those companies? Is it at a dividend cut? I mean, if you have rules, yeah. that, that's what that's what rule based. Yeah. So I, I I build those. I, I have a few feel safe, uh, feel safe mechanisms based on my learning. So one is uh, categorizing my portfolio in tiers mm -hmm. that uh, a stock can't get within a year a tier one uh, uh, company, uh, specifically not a stock with a relatively uh, new dividend growth uh, um, I said trajectory so that's just only like paying for five years dividend or something like that yeah um, so for me it means I should have observed such company already for several years to become a tier one actually um, of course maybe in the future I would change my mind but that's my feel safe mechanism um, another one um, is to reassess at a dividend cut Hence, why I sold Disney, why I sold Tupperware, um, why I didn't sell Shell, because for Shell I kept it, um, because I see that the company is in a transformation. They were already before the dividend cut, and I feel that their dividend is safe again. And from an opportunity con uh, cost point of view, I think 
it's it's fine with shell you know that the price is down of course because the whole oil industry is down so the maybe the only misjudgment i made is not on shell as such but on oil um i thought oil would recover better but there are two learnings that i took out of it the fact that you the united states is now self-reliant on 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 oil changed the political power in, in the oil industry so um, for instance the opec is not deciding on the price anymore yeah they need to already negotiate with russia but america is not even at the table yeah. so i misjudged a little bit the dynamics in the oil industry so what i did i didn't sell oil stocks i still have exxon mobile i still have chevron i still have shell but i decided not to accumulate anymore you might argue maybe this is now the time to buy them yeah if you still believe in oil but i will shift more towards new energy now better late than never i guess because i know some uh, some some friends in the past have warned me a little bit that really jumped on the tesla bandwagon at the time i didn't see it yet because i know a little bit the oil industry um and peak oil was not there yet not uh, nearby yet but maybe now due to the uh, now that really the car industry is shifting to electric vehicles yeah. maybe now uh, it's peak oil has just been brought forward so i decided to not invest anymore in oil for now uh, look it out uh, see how it develops um but if you look at my portfolio performance performance oil is really keeping me down because uh, in 2016 during the oil crisis i went full into oil based on my thesis and um i've quite some uh, i said um um, unrealized uh, losses uh, on, 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 on when you look at it from a capital gain point of view um, on oil but I'm not going to sell it because I still feel comfortable owning the um, companies but I'm now looking for new companies and new energy because energy demand is something that the world will keep having yeah I just don't think the other companies when you're into solar they are not having these high margins that an oil company has hence why they are naturally not really dividend uh, mm. payers and then you go quickly into the growth categories of stock investing which yeah. doesn't fit my style yeah and and, and look the, these companies are, are fairly new it's newish technologies so it probably makes sense for these companies not to pay dividends and to try and grow and and, and, and so yeah. as you said there, there are not many dividend in, in that dividend paying companies in that area so it's an area that I probably know a little bit about, given my, my background, and I, I should maybe pay a little bit more attention to, but I, I just haven't. Um, maybe in, in the future, I know, I know we've discussed it, and there, there was there was some post that I read recently about ESG stocks and, and environmental friendly and going down the route of, of, of more so these companies. And I think we mentioned it before, the, certainly generation under us have become a more conscious of this. So if not now in 10 years time these companies are going to play a massive part in, in the yeah. infrastructure of it so maybe now is is the time to be to be looking to get in uh, i'm just not comfortable at the minute analyzing growth stocks um mm -hmm. so it's 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 probably if i was going to get involved in that area it would probably be an etf it probably yeah. be the safest, yeah. safest option for me yeah so so I, I made some other mistakes so i don't know yet if shell was an investment mistake for me uh, they did cut their dividend yes i'm having unrealized losses but i don't i can't say yet really that it was an investment mistake uh, because i didn't realize my losses yet and i still believe in in the fees because most of the most of the people in the world call shell an oil company but it isn't an oil company it's a gas company specifically after the uh purchase of british gas and that's where my fees is around gas as a transition um i would say it, a transition um energy also uh much more cleaner than brown coal and such and, and and so not so much for for cars on gas but power plants on on on, on using uh, gas and then they are big in liquid liquid natural gas and such uh as just I think I would call the mistake as soon as that thesis would not stand anymore. I'm still standing behind it, but also, of course, the gas prices are not going anywhere at the moment. So, yeah. And any other mistakes? Have you? I know you've talked about misjudgment, but any newbie mistakes like chasing high yield and 
And uh, yeah, maybe General Electric there a little bit. Yeah. Um, General Electric for me was um, a yield chase um, in the beginning. And later I started analyzing it. And there I got the confirmation bias, and I think driven by the by the yield and the CEO. Also, again, ah, we're becoming a digital company, and that did that. Jeff Inmelt. I mean, he, if there was one guy ever a fraud as a CEO that they should lock up, then it's Jeff Inmelt because he has fooled so many people. I, I can't even think about all the retirees from General General Electric that just went broke at uh, sometimes. You know, the stories are heartbreaking when you read them, but. Um, there, all the alarm bells were there with financial engineering. Their gap versus non-gap earnings, they were really, really out of sync with each other. And that's why I'm having issues with some companies like IBM nowadays because of my experience with General Electric. That's why I'm having some issues with Starbucks at the moment at these price levels yeah, because they're just borrowing money to, to, to fund their share buy, buybacks and their uh, dividend growth. Um, I would love to have Starbucks in my portfolio. I really would love it, but then it should be around forty to fifty dollars, yeah. And they should stop uh, leveraging up. So I be I believe that their growth is not sustainable when it comes to the dividend growth. Um, so financial engineering, and seeing it but not acting on it, that has been also uh, one of those investment mistakes. Not acting on financial engineering, and I don't even mind sometimes financial engineering. But then I really want to make a conscious decision to stay with it and for what reason and not just ignoring it because of confirmation bias that oh, yeah. I love the dividend so much. And that, that's kind of a tough one, isn't it? Because you have, you have your thesis, but how, like you, well, a lot of companies do some sort of financial engineering to a degree. And you, I mean, unless you're an accountant or an extremely good at reading these financial reports, how do you differentiate? When when is a good time to to get rid of and that that yeah. that is really tough. And I I personally wouldn't have the experience. I wouldn't I wouldn't know. Yeah. Sometimes I couldn't spot even spot financial engineering. So not so. But, but what you see now in this uh, quarterly earnings, you see a lot of kitchen sink reports. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because now now is the time to cut your dividend. Now is the time to do all these impairments. Yeah, and there are many many companies that were doing large write offs of multi billions. These are just cleaning up now, uh, um, kind of everything that they were trying to postpone because it would bring the stock price down. And yeah. now they can do it in all the noise. Not many people will see it and observe it. And and yes, there is. I I, I actually when you uh, today in five. Bullet uh, Sunday, I, I shared a video from Kathy Woods from uh, ARK Investments. And she is doing, uh, she is having a speech there. And she talks about how the inverse uh, yield curve is actually more resonating with the Great Depression in, uh, in, the, in 29. Because before that, that, it was just a deflationary period. And why? Because of tech, because of innovation. And she's saying that the in inverse yield curve is now, um, our deflation is now also because tech is disrupting existing business models and effectively just making it much cheaper as well. Hence why we are in a deflationary um, environment. Now, if you think then about why companies are financially engineering, I don't know, I've, I've not done the academic research, but in my mind, I see a, a, a link there. If you can't get the growth from, you know, because population is not anymore growing or you have saturated your markets, um, customers are not willing to pay, pay higher prices anymore, then the main thing you can do then is start doing buybacks and such uh, by, by lever leveraging up debt. Yeah. And, and I see a correlation there, but I need to be watching out with such statements because I might be totally wrong, of course. Yeah. But I, I found that it really, when I heard her saying that, I felt like, cling, yeah, finally I've got an answer to um, to what I was feeling already all the time. Yeah, yeah, tech is, I see it, you know. If I look at at, at what it cost in the past uh, to buy a hard drive for pictures, yeah, you had you need to buy a few, few hundred euro a proper uh, hard drive and then a terabyte, not knowing if you use a terabyte. Yeah. 
Now you can just go to Amazon and you get with your subscription, you can get photos for free. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't need this hardware anymore. I know they use it, they use my data. And yeah, data is the currency here because what well, every time I tag a face in Amazon, that I build their AI algorithm. Mm. Yeah. It's the it's the price it's the price we pay. Yeah. So last question for me. Looking at your portfolio, what's yeah. what's what's the worst stock? What's what's the one stock that you that you don't like or don't want in that portfolio right now? Yeah, I still need to sell General Electric, but I kept it as a reminder for being you kept, stupid. You kept it, you kept it. I, I kept it as being stupid. Yeah. yeah. And it's there. Maybe it is in the in the background there's still a little bit of wishful thinking that will ever go up because the new CEO, I really like the guy. Mm. I think He's, he's just re trying to repair something beyond repairment. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough task. I don't envy him. Yeah. So, and then maybe that's also something uh, that I would, you know, if you have anyway lost quite a lot on the stock, because in this case it went from, I think, average $25 for me to $6 now. Yeah. So it's quite a lot of loss. Uh, so I thought, okay, you know, those few hundred bucks, I, I just keep in my portfolio uh, just as a learning to, to to see every day how stupid stupid I am. And I would recommend that because it, actually it helps me at least. Yeah. And look, you never know. I might go back up to 25. You just hit that sell button <laughs> and get yeah. out. How about yourself? Oh, for me, it's Glam Beer. Um, it's a very first company. I bought an Irish company and I bought how many shares? About 30, 40 shares. <laughs> I mean, I, they're not they're not a growth company, not a dividend growth company, and I keep them as well as as a reminder. I bought them because they were Irish and they paid dividends, and that was it. No other reason, and that's why I keep them. So look, the very first company I bought, kind of sentimental, but the, like if you were to look at the company now, you wouldn't touch them in a million years. So that's that's my one company I'd say. Nice. So nice, nice, short and sweet this week. Um, I hope, but I don't have anything else on it unless you have. No, I think these are my biggest learnings. So um, misjudgments, CEO yeah. misjudgments, not listening to your gut feel when there's financial engineering, uh, yield chase. Yeah, I think those that sums it up quite well. Yeah, I think a lot of people resonate with with most of what we said. And look, if there's anything else anyone has to add, I would love to hear from our community oh, yeah. what mistakes she made. Maybe something that we should look out for and, and maybe help each other to to grow and learn. So drop them in the comments below if there's if there's any mistakes we've missed out that that you've made. Um, so this is the part we usually go to listeners listener questions. Um, look, I haven't had time this week. I haven't been much on the phone. I don't know if you have any questions. No, I respect everyone's vacation, so I didn't want to bother them with asking questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll just move on then to our stock pick. And look, I've been really lazy this week. <laughs> and I'm just going to stick with what I had last week with, with Walgreens. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things that I maybe didn't mention last week. And I suppose looking at their potential growth in the future, um, they're going to start by trying to cut 1.8 billion by 2022. They've been, I think they've partnered with a German healthcare company. Um, I need to get this right, McKeeson maybe. Uh, I, my pronunciation is probably wrong, but I think that, that having a partnership there to obviously increase their offerings in the European market, which I think is quite positive. And one thing actually that 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 stood out for me was. Um, they're testing a drone delivery service. And I can't, I can't believe I didn't even mention this in the blog because I got really excited when I was reading it. Um, I love drones and we have one in, in work and I fly one because we're, we're building a new building at the back of an extension. And um, part of my job is to fly this drone every day at the same coordinates to see the progression. So mm -hmm. something was really so when I seen Walgreens, you know, I got really excited and I forgot to put it in my blog post. Um, but it just, it, it just kind of shown that they are trying to embrace new technologies and look into the future and, and uh, it's a company that I'm, I'm quite confident in that will be there in five or 10 years' time. Look, they're having a little bit of problems and the revenue is a bit flat, but I, I think that they're, they're trying to progress and, and doing the right thing. So, as I said, lazy pick, but same as last week. So, how about you? Um, 
so I'm, my stock pick for the week is Bayer. Uh, it's a German life science company um, that some people might know for their uh, recent acquisition of Monsanto in 2018. Um, that's also why I would like to also uh, be really clear here that it comes with a risk to, to invest in Bayer. So after purchasing Monsanto, uh, they didn't do their due diligence well enough because they purchased the company for $63 billion, which is quite large for, for, for a European company. And straight after that, um, the Roundup case um, uh, came to light where, where they got sued in uh, America for um, effectively that Roundup, I um, said, uh, results uh, in some, for some people in cancer. Yeah. They recently settled for 10.9 billion. It's not covering all this, all the lawsuits, but the majority of it. Um, I think the judge still needs to give their blessing on it um, for the settlement. And therefore, their debt to equity, equity ratio is quite high at the moment, 95%. What I would like to say, though, is that if you look at all the numbers from the company, it's actually under the hood. It's quite a good company. Yeah, they just made a really big mistake with um, with this acquisition by not doing the due diligence. And therefore, I do think they need to have some changes in their leadership. So for me, this is really a value play. Um, they've got, got a quite, quite good uh, dividend growth uh, um, history. Uh, you can get it now for 5% yield. Um, so not to say that this is a yield play, but you get rewarded for the risk uh, that you're taking. I have confidence in it because their products in the life science and in, in, in the healthcare space are really good. They're they're it's, it's actually good, growing quite well. And you get to get the company now for kind of a forward PE ratio of eight and a price of free cash flow of nine. Mm. And so, from a cash flow point of view, everything actually looks quite good. So yeah. this makes me believe that they can start paying off the debt they have they had the bandwidth to um, uh, do this settlement but they shouldn't get any uh, any debt body out anymore out of the closet uh, with another 10 billion because then then i would definitely not recommend it anymore uh, but i find this company now just undervalued and um, i think it's um, it's i think it's an interesting candidate if you have a little bit of appetite for risk around the settlement. Yeah. Um, but I think also the upward potential is quite high. Um, before all this stuff happened, it was trading, I think, around 120 euros, 110 euros. I'm not saying that it should be there again, but probably it deserves probably more in the range of 70 to 80 euro now. Are they on the uh, Noble 30 list? Um, I believe not, no. no. Okay. Uh, I have, I, to the full disclosure, I've got shares in it and I'm considering to add a little bit more um, here. Yeah, I, I think we mentioned before, though, as, as investors, you kind of want companies to make little mistakes, not little mistakes, but they made a mistake and it's reflected in the price. But if everything looks good underneath the hood, as, as you say, it's probably worth that little bit of risk because, I mean, in a market when prices are inflated, if a company gets punished and there's a strong outlook in the future, it's it's probably worth at least having a small, small position in them. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check them out after this. I know, I know, I know some of their products and, and I was aware of the Roundup case, um, but I haven't looked at them as a value play at all, but I'm definitely going to check it out after after this. But maybe next week I'm going to enjoy the rest of my vacation, my last <laughs> three or four hours before, before Monday. Good. So I think we came to the end of the show for today. Yeah, I, I don't know how, how short it was. It, it felt quick as always. Um, as we mentioned, both both back off vacation, so we tried to keep it short and light. And look, I hope everyone enjoyed. And as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm just curious to hear other people. And I'd like people to get involved and just tell us a little bit about them. We have a Facebook group. Um, we're always on Twitter as well. So just, just hit us up and we're always happy to to answer questions and we do actually have a discord and um, group that we have a couple of, we're not quite active on it but if someone asks a question on it we're obviously more than happy to yeah. chat to people so and we have also uh, still an event coming up 
so also they're still you know save the date for the 22nd of uh of august yeah so man, I'm, listeners. I'm excited for this and I've, I've got a couple of emails about it and, and texts and i'm trying to be coy and sort of and not give too much yeah i think we should uh announce um next next podcast we should announce what it is about so that people uh, can also a bit prepare for it yeah, doesn't yeah. really need preparation i think but you know you have always uh, some people that are eager to prepare yeah well, look we'll keep in suspense for now but just tune in yeah. next week and we'll exactly it all. but cool. look, that's that's the end of the show i've had fun as always thanks to everyone for listening we, we really appreciate it uh, hit the like button as i said and subscribe we've, we've got lots of feedback our viewer account is, is going up each week which is which is nice and look we just love chatting and interacting with you all so as i said get in touch don't be a stranger and and let us know how you're doing that's all for me anything else for you Ted? no that's it just thanks all and um, if you're still on vacation enjoy it and see you next week again see you next week thanks a million